Our passage this morning is verse 7 through 10, but I want to read for us beginning in verse 1 so we have the full context of where we're jumping in this morning. It begins with John saying, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid a hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or their hands. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. To the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is the word of our Lord. You can be seated. I know it's July 4th weekend, but I want to begin by talking about Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte, of course, is one of the most infamous figures in European history. He's often described as history's most shrewd and ambitious military leader, which is saying a lot. (laughs) He was politically ambitious, skilled in military strategy, whereas most leaders viewed the map of Europe as a conglomeration of different nations and languages and cultures and identities. Napoleon viewed the map of Europe as a successive series of battlefields to be conquered. (laughs) He entered the French military as a second lieutenant in 1789 and within 10 years had risen through the ranks all the way to what we would call a two-star general. From that, he became a politician and had himself elected as king of France, really, except they're French. They didn't call it the king of France. They called it the first chair. French for you right there. He had himself elected the first chair, from which he loved the virtues of democracy. He wrote books about how excellent democracy is because he was being elected. And once he saw the political tides turning against them, he changed his books to how evil and wicked democracy is and how people can't possibly know what's good for them. And he led a military coup, overthrowing the government and then taking the proper title of emperor. He then led a military campaign conquering most of Europe, Egypt, Syria, the Mediterranean basin. Now, what makes him so fascinating for historians, he's, I mean, he's one of the tallest figures, I guess, in in world history. (laughs) What makes him so fascinating is that his track record really is a series of defeats, but that he was able to spin into victories. He was, had a natural knack for losing battles, but making them out to be these global victories. For example, when he became a general, he gathered, took over really leading the French military. He gathered the French Navy and they were going to attack England. And once they had gotten together, they realized they were horribly outgunned and, and would be, you know, lose horribly. So he simply turned the boats around and went and invaded Egypt instead. <laughs> Egypt didn't see it coming. <laughs> He conquered Egypt, the, and this was the plan all along. Look, we didn't get schooled by the British. We defeated the Egyptians. Yay. <laughs> the British chased him down into the Mediterranean Ocean. When he tried to, to leave Egypt, the British sunk all his ships in the Mediterranean Sea. 
This didn't slow him down at all though. He just got back on shore and then invaded Syria as if that had been his plan (laughs) and proclaimed himself now the ruler of Egypt and and Syria. Eventually he worked his way back up to to France. The the British then attacked the, the French strongholds throughout the Americas and so Napoleon, rather than suffer losses in the United States, simply sold the French lands to the Americans. We call that the Louisiana Purchase. Napoleon called that brilliant. Now he doesn't have to fight the British across the world. So one defeat after another, he made himself into a conqueror. He had several children. His oldest son, he, oh, well, first he overthrew the Holy Roman Empire. He ended the Holy Roman Empire. And then he declared his oldest son to be the new emperor of Rome. The Pope loved that title, by the way. (laughs) No, the Pope became his enemy at that point when he declared his son to be the emperor of Rome. And so the Catholic Church turned turned against him. But that's no no biggie because then he just went to war against Russia. He conquered all of Europe and then attacked Russia. And Napoleon thought he was invincible. Most of the world thought he was invincible too, except the Russians. (laughs) The Russians had the classic Russian defense of fighting him by retreating and retreating and retreating until finally Napoleon got sucked all the way into the middle of Russia. Winter fell and Napoleon was crushed. There was no way to spin that defeat. As he was crushed, and put this in perspective, he invaded Moscow with 600,000 soldiers. That's more than the U.S. Navy and Air Force combined, probably. He left Russia with less than 100,000. 500,000 plus killed with his foolish invasion there. This ended up in his exile. They exiled him to a tiny island, 80 square miles. Once on this island, he did what any exiled former military dictator would do. He declared himself to be emperor of Elba. He took over the islands. In fact, he commissioned the people on Elba to be part of his court. He made a royal court like he had in Paris. He made it in Elba. Probably 20% of the population became royalty under him. (laughs) He built massive bridges on Elba like the ones he had in Paris. Keep in mind, hardly anybody lives on this rock. (laughs) But he made it out like it was God's kingdom on earth. After a year or so, he got bored there of ruling his fake empire. And so he did what anyone can do. He conquered France again. He left Elba, invaded France. That was supposed to be a joke about how easy it is to conquer France, but (laughs) 930 service doesn't find that funny, I guess. (laughs) He left Elba, conquered France, overthrew the, the new democratically elected government of France, declared himself emperor of France again, and lost his next battle and was permanently exiled. Napoleon was exiled, returns to fight, and loses again. You know, this is really a fascinating story of somebody who takes defeat after defeat, exile after exile, and turns them in to another opportunity to attack. I want that in the back of your mind this morning as we look at Revelation 20, because this can seem far-fetched when you first see what the devil does here in Revelation 20 until you view it through the lens of how people always operate, how even Napoleon operated. The devil, in a sense, took a page from Napoleon's playbook or the other way around. The devil attacked the Lord before the creation of the earth after the creation of the angels. The devil rebelled against God and was exiled to the earth. The devil turns that into an opportunity to attack Adam and Eve, gaining perhaps the devil's greatest victory ever. But this brings a crushing rebuke by the Lord who prophesies that his head will be crushed by the Messiah. The devil is then given, in a sense, free reign over the earth to tempt and to destroy, to corrupt, to harden hearts. The devil wins some and and loses some. He wins Judas, loses Christ, for example. He's ultimately bound and and he's defeated when Christ is crucified on the cross. Nevertheless, the devil regains his ability and maintains his ability to roam about the earth like a a lion looking for those to to devour, which he does even to this very moment. Then we see perhaps his greatest victory happening in Revelation after his greatest defeat. In Revelation 12, he's cast out of heaven. He's no longer allowed to accuse the brethren before, before God and before Christ. He's cast down out of heaven to earth. Finally, no access to heaven again. He turns that into an opportunity to work through the Antichrist and work through the false prophet and take control of the earth. This leads to the 
seven-year tribulation and the final battle at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Revelation 20 begins with that battle ending and Satan getting bound and thrown into the abyss, it says in chapter 20, verse one, with a great chain. He's, he's then put in, in spirit prison, a holding cell for demons where he will spend the entire kingdom of God on earth. Jesus will reign on earth for a thousand years. At the end of this thousand-year exile, the devil escapes, or it says in verse seven, is released. It's a passive verb there. It is, implies some ambiguity. You don't know if God releases him or if Satan is able to, to sneak out, so to speak. I know he can't sneak around on, on God, but it's, that's all it says right there. He is released. He gets out. He goes back to earth where he attacks mankind again. And you think, why would he think he would win this time? <laughs> because prison is not reformative. <laughs> A thousand years in the clink doesn't make him worship the Lord. A thousand years in custody, he's not released with, oh, you know, maybe I should bow the knee before Christ willingly this time after all. That's not what's produced in his heart. The people on earth are deceived by him and they go to war against Christ as well. This is the final battle of Gog and Magog it's, as it's described down in verse 8. This is really the second battle of Gog and Magog. And just so you know where this fits in scripture, Genesis 10 describes Magog. He's Noah's grandson. He went north. He populated really what's the modern day Stan nations. Those nations now are, are all Muslim, but Ezekiel 38 and 39, 38 verse two is the first place where we see Gog and Magog together. They're gonna form their, their own empire and Ezekiel is prophesying the begin of the millennial reign, the seven year tribulation where Gog and Magog will come against the Antichrist. They will, they will fight against Israel. Remember the Antichrist takes refuge in Israel. The nations of the earth come to attack him. This is described in Revelation 16 and then in, in 18 is the fall of Babylon and then chapter 19 is the defeat in this battle. That's the the first battle of Gog and Magog, where the nations of the earth, led by those alliance of nations that are opposed to Israel, attack Israel and the Antichrist there. Remember, that's not a battle of good guys versus bad guys. They're all bad guys. The Lord returns in that battle, puts his foot on Mount Zion and the Mount of Olives, splits the Mount of Olives and establishes his kingdom there, destroys those in the battle of Gog and Magog, sending them into the, the lake of fire and sets up his kingdom on earth where he will reign for a thousand years. The phrase Gog and Magog, it's not even necessarily a geographic area, although I do think it refers to the, the stand nations. You understand that during the kingdom, the earth is, is remade, it's reformed. It becomes a new heavens and, and new earth. The earth is, is redone during the kingdom. The national boundaries aren't the same anymore. The ethnic boundaries aren't the same anymore. The language divisions aren't the same anymore. The earth is changed during the thousand year reign of Christ on it. And, Back in May, I preached several messages in this. I don't want to rehash all of them, but just know the earth has changed during this time. And so here when it says there's a final battle of Gog and Magog, I don't think the same Kazakhstan and Pakistan and Afghanistan, I don't think those same nations are still there during the thousand year reign. I think they've changed enough, but Gog and Magog has become an idiom for just the nations, the far flung nations of the earth. We use geographic locations like that. We say, I mean, that, that's off in Timbuktu, but you don't really mean it's in Timbuktu. Right, you don't even know where Timbuktu is, do you? <laughs> Asia, or possibly Africa, who knows? First hour was split, I won't take a vote this hour. <laughs> you say something's in Timbuktu, you don't mean it's actually in Timbuktu. You mean it sits far away when you say, oh man, Congress is like the Wild West right now. You don't mean it's actually at the foot of the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> it's just an idiom that you use for something like that. So it is with Gog and Magog. It's an idiom that means the far-flung nations of the world. In other words, what happens at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ is that all the nations of the earth, they all gather to attack Israel. They're numbered like the sand of the seashore, verse nine says. It means it's, it's everybody, it's the earth. Remember, the thousand-year reign of Christ in the earth is Jesus, it's resurrected saints, but also the earth is being populated. There are people, fallen people, born in the likeness of Adam that are not resurrected, that are, are, are populating, they're marrying, they're having children. The earth is decimated at the end of the tribulation, but it's repopulated through the kingdom. By the end of the thousand years, the earth is entirely repopulated. And the people that are born into it are not born loving Jesus. They're born fallen. The Sermon on the Mount is still true for them. They still have 
murder in their hearts. The way is still narrow to eternal life. And, and they're, they're filled with self-righteousness, these people are, as they fill the earth. Remember, Satan is bound. So there's no demonic temptation. The earth is better during this time because Satan's not ro- roaring about. Nevertheless, people become self-righteous because look how good things are. There's resurrected saints around. Jesus is on the throne. Look how good the earth is. And they become self-righteous to the point that at the end of the thousand years, they actually rebel against Christ. This is the final gather of the demonically inspired war. You see in verse nine, they're gonna attack Jerusalem. They go up to the beloved city. If they're on the plains of the earth, God remakes the earth. Remember the mountains that are around Jerusalem are, are brought low, scripture says. The mountains are lowered, the plains are raised, the earth becomes relatively flat, Jerusalem becomes elevated because the river flows out of that, Ezekiel 38 through 40 describes. So Jerusalem remains elevated, many of the mountains of the earth are laid low, the armies gather on the plains to attack the holy city. And why are they attacking Israel? Because Israel has a favored status during the millennial kingdom. Haggai chapter 2 describes that, Hebrews 12 describes that. Jesus is reigning through them. He's fulfilling his promises to them in the Old Testament. And so the nations turn against Christ and turn against Israel and attack Jesus and attack Jerusalem. This is the final failed kingdom coup. I'm gonna give you an outline this morning. Three responses from a failed kingdom coup. Three responses from this failed kingdom coup. It's the devil's attempt to overthrow Christ once and for all. And of course it fails when fire comes from heaven and consumes them. How should we respond to this story? Three ways. First, guard yourself from sin's deception. Guard yourself from sin's deceptions. One hand, it's stunning that this battle happens. You think, how could people rebel against Christ when he's on the earth? I mean, we can be so naive. (laughs) We think, oh, if Jesus were here, all the divisions would be done away with. If Jesus was here, there would be no more pride and no more arguing and no more jostling for position, no more political strife. If only Jesus was here. Ha! (laughs) Have you met a person before? (laughs) When Jesus was here the first time, he didn't get rid of strife. (laughs) He's gonna reign perfectly on the earth, but he's not gonna get rid of sin in fallen people. If they come to Christ, their sin is forgiven. I mean, just think about how, think about some of the rebellions of world history. And on one hand, it's stunning that people rise up and rebel against Christ, but on the other hand, it's not so stunning because it's filled with unbelievers, the earth is. It's been repopulated and, and sin makes people delusional. You know, think of, for example, Adam and Eve. They were walking with God in the garden. There's two of them (laughs) and they're walking with God in the garden and they rebel against God. Think of Pharaoh. Think of the signs that Pharaoh saw through God through Moses. Think of the plagues, the river turning to blood, the frogs. Think of Moses' staff becoming like a a, a snake. Think of the darkness and the light. Think Think of the first nine plagues and at the end of all nine of them, Pharaoh still won't bow the knee to the Lord. He still rebels against the Lord. The 10th plague comes, his son dies, he lets Moses escape, and then he changes his mind and goes after Moses after all of that. People rebel against God. David had a conversation with Nathan in 2 Samuel 7 where he was told that he will be the, the ancestor for the Messiah. The Messiah will descend from him And what, four chapters later, he's falling into immorality and sinning against God. Jonah rebels against God and has a fantastic prayer of repentance from the belly of a a fish. 40 days later, he's back to rebelling against God. Think of Judas. He sees Jesus walking on the water. He hears, he's a front row seat to the Sermon on the Mount. He sees Jesus raise the dead heal the blind, and he rebels against Christ. So don't think that people that are on the kingdom, in the kingdom where Jesus is, that they won't rebel against him also. It's because sin makes people delusional. It deceives them. Look at verse eight. Satan's gonna come out and deceive the nations. It does not say Satan's gonna come out and illuminate the nations. (laughs) 
He's not gonna come out and shine a bright light on everybody and let them see things the way they really are. That's not what sin does. That's not what Satan does. Satan doesn't illuminate, he obscures. He doesn't shine a light, he brings darkness. He doesn't tell the truth, he deceives. Sin is delusional. It corrupts people. It makes people worse off. Sin has never made anybody better off, a little bit at all, ever. Sin makes good people bad and bad people worse. Sin unmans men, it dehumanizes. Adam and Eve were made perfect but capable of change and sin was the vehicle through which they were changed. Adam is just the Hebrew word for man. Woman, Eve, uh, uh, or Isha, her original name means from man. Adam and Eve, mankind, and those two people were made with soul and body to glorify God. And sin corrupts both. Their body was made perfectly by God. Sin corrupts their body and the earth is filled with cancer and and chaos and disease because of it. Their souls were made perfectly by God to glorify him and delight in him and sin corrupts their souls, causes them to rebel against God. That's what I mean by sin dehumanizes. It unmans men. It corrupts their body and darkens their soul. It clouds their vision. It clouds their judgment. And I shouldn't say there. It clouds your vision and your judgment. It makes you more foolish than you think you are. It makes you more susceptible to lies and deception than you think you are. Sin distorts your memory. It makes you forget what last time you sinned was really like. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it again. It lies about its benefits. It causes temporary amnesia. You you forget how awful things were last time you sinned, and so you get sucked into it again. It elevates you by making you think you can stand against sin or you can just do this little sin and it won't have worse consequences than that. And it lowers God by making you think his glory is not worth standing up for. Somebody who sinned doubts the power of scripture and also doubts the power of sin. The person who sins even against rebelling Christ, even in the light of rebelling Christ in the kingdom or in light of your own sin in your life, when you sin, you're doubting scripture because you're denying that what scripture says is true for you or right for you. And you're doubting the power of sin because you think you can do that sin without ultimately being destroyed. Without it having a negative effect on you, you'll just bounce right back, you think. Ask yourself, did Pharaoh bounce back? Have you seen more or less of God's power in your life than Pharaoh did? Ask yourself, did Judas bounce back? Have you seen more or less of Christ's teaching in your life than Judas did? Sin distorts your perception of those things. It degrades your soul. Degrades your soul to the point where God says in Genesis 6, I know what's in the heart of man. It is only evil continually. That's the fallen condition of mankind. And that's true here in Revelation 20. What's in the heart of mankind? Man that doesn't love Christ, it's only evil continually. It darkens your understanding, sin does. That's why it's called darkness. That's why scripture says you're saved from darkness to light. That's why sin has to traffic in lies, in gossips, in innuendo, in secrets. That's where sin does its bidding. That's why Jesus says you lie because your father is the devil and he's a liar from the beginning. Sin doesn't proclaim the truth or it wouldn't work. So the devil comes out and he deceives. If he can deceive those in the kingdom on earth where Christ is reigning, do you think he can deceive you? How vigilant against sin should you be? If he can bring the world and if he can gather the nations that are on the earth where Christ is reigning, do you think that you should be on your guard against sin? Listen, you're not as strong as you think you are. You're not as spiritually mature as you think you are. You're not as impervious to the effects of sin in your life as you think you are. If you let sin into your heart, it will come in, move in, and bring friends. (laughs) It will corrupt, destroy, obscure, cloud, dehumanize, distort, deceive. That's what it will do in your heart. So take stock of your heart. 
See if there's any affections you've allowed in your heart that are not righteous. See if there's any room you've given sin to, to grow roots in your life and then weed them, pull them out. Throw them out of your heart and lock the door behind it. Because if you leave sin in your heart, if you leave room for affections in your heart, you are leaving room for this kind of overthrow. The step between just catering to watching inappropriate things or listening to inappropriate things or loving inappropriate things to full-scale rebellion against Christ, that is a small step, my friends. You think there's an ocean between them. It's not an ocean. It's a hop, skip, and a jump. So take stock of your heart. In my house, we have a raccoon that likes to come in our house right now. Particularly our sunroom, that's where he prefers because our cat food is there. So he's our friendly neighborhood raccoon. When we leave now, we've got to lock up the house. There's a very specific order you have to go through when you lock up the house. First of all, you have to make sure the raccoon is out of the sunroom before you lock the door. <laughs> Some lessons you've got to learn the hard way, I guess. <laughs> You have to make sure the cat is in the sunroom and you have to make sure the kids are in the car. If you mix up those three. <laughs> don't lock sin in your heart. Don't lock Christ out of your heart. Understand that you have to be vigilant against the inroads of sin. Get it out and close up shop. Secondly, guard your heart against the sin's deception. Secondly, encourage yourself by Satan's defeat. Encourage yourself by Satan's defeat. And Satan is, of course, defeated here. His rebellion, after escaping from prison, goes about as well as Napoleon's return went. He comes back and brings war to the earth. He deceives the nations. He comes back stronger even than when he left, the devil does. This is something the Jews believed. The Jews believed that it was unwise actually to cast demons out of people because if you cast a demon out of an unrighteous person, the demon would come back with more of his friends. Jesus talks about this in Luke 11. He says, woe to you Pharisees. You cast a demon out of somebody, but you don't clean up the man's heart. So the demon comes back with seven of his friends. His second condition is worse than his first. <laughs> so the Jews had this mindset, if the devil goes away, he comes back, he's going to come back stronger than when he went. What's the devil doing in prison? Working out is what the Jews would say. <laughs> Getting stronger. And so he comes back stronger than when he left, but he's still no match for the Lord. He's going to be captured by the Lord. Fire is going to come down and, and end this rebellion. Verse 10, the devil who deceived them is thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the, beast and the false prophet are also. So it's a great reunion. This demonic trinity is back together again. The Antichrist was a puppet of the, the devil during the tribulation and he was thrown into the lake of fire in Revelation 19. Now he's reunited with the devil himself. The false prophet was exploited by the Antichrist back in Revelation 17. He too was thrown into the lake of fire. He, now he too is reunited with the devil. They're all together, one big happy demonic Trinitarian family, you could say, in the lake of fire and brimstone where they will be tormented, it says, day and night forever and ever. Day and night being an idiom for there's no rest. Doesn't mean the sun is rising and setting in hell. It means there's no rest for them 24-7. There's no respite from suffering. It is eternal, continual, forever and ever and ever. This is the fate of the devil. The one who raised his fist against God in glory back in Genesis 1 is the one who will suffer forever in Revelation 20. And that's what scripture is bracketed with. The devil rebels and he ends his life with suffering eternally. Their newfound strength in this final rebellion is all for naught because they have nothing that can really combat the Lord. The devil has a complicated win-loss record. <laughs> he defeated Adam and Eve, but he had his head crushed by Adam's descendant. He hardened Pharaoh, but he lost Moses. He won over Judas, but he lost Jesus. 
Now he's escaped from prison, but bound in hell forever and ever. This is the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, where it says that his head will be crushed. It's the fulfillment of John 12.21, where Jesus declares the ruler of this age will be done away with. I mean, the devil twisted his defeats into victories, so much so that he was even proclaimed the king of this world. Paul says in Ephesians 2, he's the prince of the power of the air. But he may be the ruler of this age. He may be the, the, the one who has authority over most of the hearts of most of the earth. And it's not eternal authority. It will end. He will be cast out. He will be crushed. He will be bound in hell forever and ever and ever. That's why we shouldn't live in fear of the devil. We should encourage ourselves with this. You shouldn't be afraid of the devil. I know there's so many of the, the charismatic churches that live in this fear of the sovereignty of Satan, really, that if you don't pray the right way or if you don't do the right thing, that Satan will get a, a foothold in your family. It's foolishness. If you love Christ, you shouldn't fear the devil. You should fear God, not Satan. Because you know what happens to Satan. You've heard it said, don't fear the devil, because you, you say, I don't fear the devil because I know how the story ends. Well, this is how the story ends right here. <laughs> when you say, I've read the end of the book, this is the part you're talking about. Here's where the devil is bound and sent to hell. You don't need to fear him or fear his demons. You resist the devil, but you resist the devil by arming yourself with the sword of the spirit, by arming yourself with the, the armor of God. But you recognize that this battle is fought not so much on the outside of you, but on the inside of you, in your affections, in your heart, by how you love Christ. You resist the devil by standing firm against him in your heart, by loving the things that God loves, fleeing from sin, why should you flee from sin? Because you know how the story ends. <laughs> you know that sin was brought to you by the devil as he brought it into the world. So don't listen to him. Don't believe sin. Don't believe the lie. The devil loses. Sin is defeated. Don't love the loser. <laughs> Treasure Christ instead. Encourage yourself with this good news. The devil, God's most staunch opponent throughout time will have an eternal judgment. Thirdly, remind yourself of the sinner's damnation. Guard your heart against sin's deception. Encourage your, yourself based on the devil's defeat and remind yourself of the sinner's damnation. Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet are not the lone occupants of hell. You see this hinted at in verse 9 where the fire comes down from heaven and devours them. This is hearkening back to Sodom and Gomorrah. This is exactly what Peter wanted Jesus to do to the Samaritans. Remember, Lord, call down fire and, and smoke him out. And Jesus says, no, not yet, really. Here's where he finally says, yes, that fire does come down. It does consume them all. Those that rose up against Christ, those that had not, and this is the whole earth that rises up against Christ. Everybody except those who are saved through faith. They rise up against him. They'll all be judged. More on that next week when we read about their judgment, but suffice it to say for now, all those who died apart from Christ will join the devil and the Antichrist and the false prophet in the lake of fire, which will last forever and ever and ever. People say, oh, forever and ever is an idiom for a really long time. Well, I hope not because it's the same phrase that's used for how long heaven is. Hell is just as long as heaven is. Hell is just as long as Satan is removed from heaven, which is forever and ever, day and night. Let's not lose sight of what's happening in this passage. Jesus has claimed himself to be the king of the world, the sovereign over the universe. In a generic sense, he is the sovereign of the universe. Satan has volition. Satan can still act. Satan can still do things under the permissive will of God. Satan can't act against the direct orders of God, but God has given Satan volition, much as he's given you and I volition, to, to act and to, to do as we please according to the, our hearts. That's how Satan operates. But that's going to come to a screeching halt when he's cast into hell. Jesus is still the sovereign of the universe, but he's more than generically the sovereign of the universe. He also claims to be sovereign over your heart in particular, over your affections in particular. You know, Napoleon, when he was exiled, went to Elba and he ran his sort of mock country. It's kind of humorous. He made their own currency. They hadn't had currency before. He made their own currency so they could give it back to him in homage. It's sort of humorous, isn't it? The emperor of Europe setting up shop on this 80 square mile rock. 
It's a tourist destination today. You can go see what he did with that place. When the Lord defeats his enemies, he's not going to exile them to some island. It's not going to be ironic. It's not going to be funny. It's not going to be, oh, it's a lot like ruling in this world except in a smaller scale. It won't be like that at all. It's going to be eternal suffering forever and ever so the victory of Christ is clearly on display for all eternity. In between Satan's rebellion in Genesis 1 and his defeat in Genesis 20, in between the the garden and the lake of fire, in between those bookends, of course, is the cross. And that's where Jesus stakes his claim. That's where he, in a sense, has bound Satan, paying the penalty for sin. Those who don't exercise faith in Christ, they're going to be consumed by fire from heaven in their physical body and fire from heaven in hell forever. But for those who do put faith in Christ, understand that God has the same kind of wrath for you. The same wrath that manifests itself in fire from heaven is also for you, those who have faith in Christ, but it was poured out on Christ. Where Jesus, he didn't have fire from heaven come on him. He had justice and wrath from God come on him. All this fire isolated in one person as he suffered on the cross, bearing the penalty for sin. He then rises from the dead to stake his claim as Lord, not just generically over the universe, not just specifically over Satan, but specifically over your heart. And so your choice then is whether you be deceived by sin and think that you don't need a savior, be deceived by your own self-righteousness and think that you can stand before Christ, in which case this is the fire that awaits you. Or you humble yourself. You go from the darkness to the light. You put your faith in Christ. And the wrath and justice of God will not be poured out on you as fire, but is poured out on Christ as atonement instead. When you place your faith in Christ, you have new life. This is not the end of your story. We'll see that later on in Revelation. Lord, we're thankful that you have given us the end of the story out of your love for us. Lord, we love you as well because you've loved us first. We love you because Christ died for us, bearing your wrath for our sin. We rejoice that you have conquered the devil, though not in time yet. We look forward to the time when it comes to pass. We rejoice that you have given us new life and shown us your mercy. Lord, help us guard our hearts against sin. We don't want to be deceived by sin or the devil. Encourage our hearts because we know that Satan will be defeated. Lord, we're reminded of the end that awaits those that don't know you. Use us this week, we pray, to go into the world and bring the good news of Jesus Christ to others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to Emmanuel with Pastor Jesse Johnson. You can find more resources like this at ibcva.com. Here is a parting word from Pastor Jesse. If you have any questions about what you heard today, or if you want to learn more about what it means to follow Christ, please visit our church website, ibcva.com. If you're not a member of a local church and you live in the Washington, D.C. area, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Emmanuel. We're located in Northern Virginia, and for more information about when and where we worship, check out our church website. I hope to personally meet you this Sunday after our service. But no matter where you live, it's our hope that everyone who uses this resource is involved in their own local church. Now may God bless you this week as you seek Jesus constantly, serve the Lord faithfully, and share the gospel boldly.